about the basics of the forage budget. And there's two sides to that forage budget. There's the animal side and there's the forage side. And what we're gonna expand on today is some of that forage side, maybe get into a more accurate number of what you're seeing production-wise on your own property. Okay, so yesterday we talked about when we're doing the forage side and we're setting at home, there's a real simple way we can just do some rule of thumb calculations and we would assume if we're not making any inputs on introduced forage, how much production are we getting per acre? One ton. One ton. One ton per acre and it'd be the same if we have native because we're gonna leave half, take half, right? All right, so that's a good starting point but that's by far not accurate for all of our places. As you can see, Many of y'all know we've got lowland type sites that can produce two to three tons, uplands produce less. So what we're gonna do today is talk about, you know, how can we do some real time uh, in the field testing of, of what our forage yield is. And I'm also gonna talk to you just briefly right now about a way we can maybe get a little bit more accurately from the comforts of our own home. And that's through using a, a online tool called Web Soil Survey. Anybody use that? Anybody familiar with the old plat books, the soil survey books that the NRCS offices have had? Okay, that's the old books that, that information or that data was compiled back in the 30s and the 40s by the CCC. People went all over the United States ground proofing what types of soils was where, and they mapped that. That is now online. You can get to that from your home uh, on the internet. You simply go to Web Soil Survey, you can type it into Google. Uh, when that page comes up, there's a little green start button. You click start and it gives you an aerial photo of the world, essentially, of the earth. And you continue to zoom in on that until you find your property, okay? And then what we're gonna do, there's a little button called a, the AOI button, area of interest. And you're gonna click on that and then delineate the border of your property. And that says, this is my area of interest is within this boundary fence. And as soon as you click that, what it does is it will go through this property and it will pull up every soil type that's there. Okay, so it's gonna tell you the soil types <laughs> that you're seeing on your property and how many acres. So it'll tell you you've got 80 acre place, 9.2 acres are a DeWitt silt loam, 3.6 acres are a Calhoun clay, you know, whatever it might be. So now you've got a pretty good idea, well, if I've got a clay soil, I can't grow this. Crabgrass doesn't grow as good on clay. Uh, if I've got a pure sand, I'm not gonna grow fescue on that. So we're already starting to figure out, you know, where a certain species gonna be suited to. And that's one big thing I wanna point out with Web Soil Survey. The way I use it the most is helping producers not fight mother nature. I see too many times I get called out and somebody says, yeah, you know, I planted this field of Bermuda four times and I just can't get it to take. Typically that's mother nature saying there's a reason Bermuda doesn't want to grow there. And usually when you look at Web Soil Survey, you see, yeah, well that site's way better suited for fescue than it is for Bermuda. Okay, so don't fight mother nature. It's gonna save you money in the long run. On that tool, there's gonna to be a little tab called Vegetative Suitability Index, okay? And what that is, if you click on that, I know it sounds like a big name, it's really pretty simple. If you click on that, it's gonna give you a drop down list of all the species that are suited for your area in the United States, okay? So we'll use, let's say a little farther east, it might have Bermuda, it might have Bahia, fescue, small grains, it might even put in corn or sorghum sudan, something like that. And if we select Bermuda, it's going to tell us for each one of those soils within that AOI what our expected production for the year is. So now instead of that rule of thumb guess, 2,000 pounds per acre, it's going to say, no, that DeWitt silt loam is 4,100 pounds per acre. That Calhoun clay is 3,300 pounds per acre. So, yes, sir. Does that website map it out on your property? Yes, okay. maps it out. And when you go to the vegetative suitability index, it color codes it. So blues and greens are more suited to that species. Reds and grays are not suited. So you can actually get a graphical representation of where is fescue gonna grow best in my place? Where is Bermuda gonna grow best? Where would be a good spot for me to overseed ryegrass? That's all on there. And, and now ryegrass, you won't find it, but it's very similar to small grains, to wheat. So you just use your wheat. Again, when you get that yield, you can take 9.7 acres of DeWitt silt loam times the yield, 4,100 pounds, and that tells us how much that soil type is producing on our property. If you sum all of those different soil types up, what do you get? What's that? Total 
production. Total production for the place. Now we've got a more accurate estimation of what our forage production is, rather than two ton, or excuse me, one ton per acre. All right, so that's a way you can go home, you can play with that at home. Pretty useful tool. There's way more information than that in there. There's, you know, suitability of soils for building materials. There's all kinds of stuff in there. So again, I'd encourage you to look at that. Uh, one of the issues I will tell you that I have seen using that tool is past history. Okay, so the one thing that it doesn't look at is what has been done with that piece of property, that 20 acre meta for the last 60 years. So sometimes I go out and a producer says, this is my hay meta, this is my dad's hay meta, this is my granddad's hay meta. We bail it three times a year and I've never fertilized it. What do you think it looks like? Sage grass, it's broom sedge. We've harvested all the nutrients out of that soil. So again, past history of that is not gonna be portrayed in Web Soil Survey. That's where you need some experience on that place to say, yeah, that was farmed in wheat for years. It's not gonna produce that. Make sense? Okay, so that's a good tool that can give you a baseline when you're sitting in the house. What we're gonna do today with these yardsticks is we're gonna go out and actually measure real-time forage production. Now again, this is not without its flaws. This is not super accurate to tell us what our seasonal growth is. All this is telling us is a snapshot in time, how much forage do we have available right now for our herd. Okay, so if I went around to every paddock and measured it, I'd know exactly how much forage is left here. All right, now, granted, grass is growing every day, or we hope it is when conditions are good. We can't account for that, but I can at least say I have, at the minimum, 71 days of grazing left for my herd before I'm totally out of forage. Does that make sense? Palatable, highly digestible, good quality grass. A lot of times you don't see much of it in a pasture if you've got livestock in there. This was one of your options yesterday that went along, I believe, with the cowpea. Crabgrass. Okay, and that seed head is pretty telling of crabgrass, but again, very digestible, low fiber content. That's a really good forage for livestock. And then of course this one, many of y'all that are from around here, y'all are gonna know what that is. That's Bermuda grass. And JJ, he doesn't want Bermuda grass here, but he's made a pretty good Bermuda, Bermuda grass stand with goats. So again, JJ coming here, we've usually done our measurements here in the past. This was pretty much solid Bermuda grass in this field. He come in and he clipped it really short uh, and then he dissed this field up. And again, it's super soggy down here, so we're not gonna walk through that. But then he planted some small grains and the small grain that he selected here was wheat. Okay, so a lot of y'all probably have experience with that or you've thought about planting it. Extremely high quality forage, especially in the fall and winter. Uh, so again, if we're grazing goats, cattle, whatever it might be on wheat, we don't need hay, we don't need supplementation because we're meeting their daily requirements. He did admit, you know, he come out through here and he actually seeded this by hand. Not a bad stand, we've got some, some spots here that are a little more sparse, but again, you don't have to have a load of equipment to do things like this, especially on a smaller scale. You know, if you can get it disc up, get it seeded, you'll be okay. Now one thing that I, I do want to point out as we go through here, many of y'all are kind of from this area, so I want to take that and just pass it around. If you've seen wheat, just pass it on. But what you're going to notice here is you've got a plant, vibrant green color in this area. How many hairs do you see on those leaves? That's the big thing I want you to look at. And there should be basically no hairs on these wheat leaves. All right, so that's gonna be a key identifying characteristic. I get questions all the time. I went out and planted wheat. I don't think I've got wheat coming up. What is it? This is definitely wheat. If you don't have any hairs, wheat, rye, triticale, oats, they'll all fall into that category. Now they kind of have a dullish sheen to the leaf and I'm gonna carry that with me and show you what I mean by shiny here in a minute. So let's move on over here to this other corner. Looks like a really good stand of wheat from here, right? So again, looks like a good wheat stand, right? Looks very similar to that. But what I want you to do is pass this plant around and look down at the base of that stem. And you can kind of see it if you hold it up against black. Do y'all see those hairs on that stem? That tells us that's not wheat. What we're actually seeing right here is in the brome family, okay? So that could be what people call cheat. Uh, that could be various types of brome. There's Japanese brome, downy brome, smooth brome. Those are all cool season annual type grasses. 
They're very effective reseeders. They drop a lot of seed. They'll come up year after year. Again, this is not bad grazing at this point in time, but it's not the quality that our small grains or ryegrass would be. Especially when we get into March and April, uh, usually by mid-March to late March, these are already browning out. They've already produced seed and they're browning out. We're just really getting cranking with wheat production, ryegrass production. So again, if you've got a lot of that, that looks good now, but it's not gonna give us the production that our small grains or our ryegrass would. And that's the easiest way to tell uh, the two apart. If you see hairs anywhere on the stem, that's not gonna be the ryegrass and that's not gonna be our small grains. That's a brome species. Did he get that as a mix intentionally? No, this is actually would be, just be native. I don't wanna call it native because they're not native grasses. They come from overseas, uh, but they're just here. They're in, yeah, they're natural. They're inherent to this site. They reseed themselves year after year. A lot of y'all probably have this on your own place. You know, you'll see it come up in the spring and pop the seed heads out. Again, it's not bad forage, it's just not truly what we're looking for to meet that rotational system that we were talking about yesterday. Sufficient nitrogen down, we can be well over boot top deep even by this time of year, okay? So the, the only difference there is nitrogen, nutrition of that plant. Nitrogen is that driving force, that fuel behind forage yield, okay? And we talked about that yesterday. So again, it sounds like, man, that's a shot in the dark to go put that nitrogen out, but you can see yourself what kind of difference it makes in your pastures. And the best way to see that is what we call pock marks. Uh, I've heard it called cattle mosaic virus, but it's anywhere you see a wheat field and you see those green, round green circles out there, that's manure and urine spots. And that's the nitrogen being released there and a lot of times the height difference is drastic and therefore the yield dif difference is drastic too. So if you're seeing any of that, that tells you you're a little bit short of nitrogen. That's the best way to figure out, am I meeting my nit nitrogen needs in my plant? Again, that good green color you see right over there, sufficient nitrogen in that area for us to really be achieving the yields we want. So let's roll out here and look at that. Yes, ma'am. Is it gonna affect the other minerals in the soil if you're constantly throwing nitrogen down? Like, is that gonna... Yes. What imbalances is that gonna cause and what do we do about that? If you're grazing, not much. You're not changing phosphorus levels, potassium levels much. If you're haying a field, yes. Okay. Because you have to think, haying, we're basically harvesting all those nutrients from that above ground portion of the stem. Okay. If we start fertilizing with 150, 200 units in, we're making more forage and harvesting more nutrients at a faster rate. Okay, but if it's staying in there. That's right. If you're grazing, about 90% of that P and K gets recycled through the back of the animal. Gotcha. So a lot of that doesn't go anywhere over time. Okay. Ryegrass, annual ryegrass. Again, JJ had a water line he put in here. Annual ryegrass is used very frequently as a stabilization type crop. It comes up really well when you throw it down. But this is annual ryegrass and it's kind of hard to see. Uh, but again, you don't have any hairs on it. And typically if we had a little more size on that and the sun was shining, you would see a shine on that leaf, okay? So that's one of the differences with it compared to our small grains. It gets a real shine to it. Much finer as it comes up, but again, you can see some of these plants have started getting a little more size on them. Leaves start to get a little bigger. Uh, but again, that annual ryegrass is a really good option too. Super high quality, comparable to wheat, rye, triticale, all of those. And the beauty of annual ryegrass versus our small grains is what? You don't have to have a drill to put it in the ground. Annual ryegrass can be seeded right on top of the ground, even into sod like that, and it will make a stand through the winter. So it pegs down very effectively. So for most of us, you know, we're not in the business of farming, we're running livestock, we don't have all that equipment. Annual ryegrass is a great cool season option. You just spread it on top of the ground and it makes good yields. You don't have to work the ground up at all. Would it benefit you any to work the ground? <coughs> yes. If you was to go in and drill ryegrass, we would expect not only better stands, uh, that canopy over faster, but we would get increased fall and winter yields. And typically one of the things, especially in this part of the country with annual ryegrass, we tell people, don't count on it for fall and winter yield. It's just not gonna make much. It doesn't get a whole lot bigger than that until we get to about mid-March or so. But now we can make huge yields, even more than what wheat can even possibly do, if we're willing to put the nitrogen on it in March, April, and May. That's where the bulk of its production occurs. Again, you can cheat it a little bit if you do drill it into the ground, 
People will use a hair, scratch the ground, that will give you a slightly better stand. But again, it's not necessary if you're only wanting late winter grazing. Broadcast stand will give you good late winter grazing.